Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium, and it's great to see all of you here this evening, although you're, you're virtual now, and we're hoping to have you back in person very soon. I want to thank the sponsors for our lecture series, Gazette Newspapers, and Courtyard Marriott. Tonight, it's a real pleasure to have, have Dr. Randy Rochin, and she's going to talk to us about the corals you know and the corals that you don't know. She is, is uh, a research assistant professor at Boston University's marine program. It's called BUMP, the Boston University Marine Program, quite a well-known program. She's also the chief scientist, co-chief scientist, of the Phoenix Island uh, Protected Area Conservation Trust, where she plays a very important role in setting the research agenda for the world's largest and deepest UNESCO World Heritage Site. She received her bachelor's degree from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, her PhD from Tufts University. She went from there to a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard and then joined the New England Aquarium where she was on the research staff and made important contributions for eight years. She then joined the Boston University Marine Program and she's been there ever since. She's a member of the Explorers Club, a member of W2O, Women Working for the Ocean, and uh, she is on or has been on four important editorial boards. She's unusual among coral scientists, I think, in that she studies all of them, tropical, temperate, shallow water, deep water, and she's able to make good comparisons and contrasts among these different species that inhabit these different environments. She's a friend and a colleague, and it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Randy Rochin. Randy, take it away. Thanks, Jerry. It is always an incredible honor to um, work with you and with the Aquarium of the Pacific. I um, was so delighted when the Aquarium of the Pacific became a partner to um, the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, and it is an honest joy and honor and pleasure to work on this project with you and to share some of the findings from this really excited protected area of the world. So thank you very much for having me, especially in this virtual environment, <laughs> which is really fun. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys today uh, about some of the corals you know, uh, we all know and love from shallow water snorkeling or from aquarium exhibits or from scuba diving, and some of the ones that you probably don't know about or you don't get to see very much um, very much because they live in the deep sea. And I wanted to contextualize this talk with um, the comment that I'm going to talk to you exclusively about corals from the Phoenix Islands Protected Area today in honor of the partnership um, that the Aquarium of the Pacific has with HIPAA, the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. But um, I just wanted to put in a plug and just let you guys know that our lab actually work, does work on New England temperate corals and a bunch of other coral species. And um, I have some fabulous students. So if you're interested in that, um, check out our laptop website. Okay, so talking about corals is these days a fairly depressing topic. And when I first became a marine scientist, I did not go into coral reefs because they were dying. Um, I wanted to, I just thought they were beautiful and fascinating and had a lot of really um, interesting things to discover. But it's impossible these days to be a coral reef biologist and to not um, sort of put all of your work in the context of global coral reef decline which is a problem that is, uh, it's pervasive. It, uh, and it doesn't matter where in the world you look, in the shallow water environments, we see that over time, the percentage of live coral is disappearing and is declining and coral reefs are suffering from a myriad of really um, important and urgent issues. The thing is, I'm an ocean optimist. And when I look around the world, I see these stories of sadness, but I also see these corals that are surviving against all odds and have this incredible, remarkable longevity in some of these rare cases. This happens to be Big Mama. It is a large Parades coral from American Samoa in a place called the Land of Giants. And it has, they think she's about 500 years old. And um, there are other corals which are just about this old and this big, and this big, but this is one of the largest we think in the shallow water environment. 40 meters in circumference, this coral has been around for 500 years of human history and has survived everything we've thrown at it. And so when we see corals dying and we see some corals surviving, the obvious question is why and how? And can they, and 
can these corals survive um, even with what's coming? And to me, that is one of the really important pieces of contemporary coral biology is trying to understand coral resilience in the context of global change. So when we think about resilience, there's really two pieces of it. There's resisting um, bleaching. So corals are animals that have a partnership. They're photosynthetic symbionts. You can think of them as tiny little algae that live within the coral and photosynthesize the same way plants do. And there's this, this two-way partnership, this mutualism between them. And when corals are stressed, that partnership breaks down and they bleach. And so a resilient coral can either resist bleaching to begin with or can recover quickly from bleaching and or recover at all from bleaching. And those two, two components, recovery and resistance, are the components of resilience that we look for in reefs all over the world. And in particular, like I said, today I'm gonna to be talking about corals in the Phoenix Islands protected area, which is right in the middle of the Pacific, which is huge. And uh, just for context, I mean, um, here is Hawaii. I don't know if you guys, yeah, you can see my cursor, right? I hope. Okay, so here's Hawaii up here. Here's um, New Zealand, here's Fiji. And right in the middle is the Phoenix Islands um, protected area. Just put a little context on that for you. Here you go. Um, and there are many, many things that are amazing about this protected area uh, that deserve superlative and deserve a little um, attention. So first, this is the um, largest and deepest UNESCO World Heritage Site in the world. Second, it is owned and operated by the Republic of Kiribati, spelled Kiribati. Um, and they are an incredible country who has done a really amazing thing by protecting this very large area of the ocean, roughly the size of California for perspective. Um, and the Republic of Kiribati has done this um, and has not just created this protected area, but it's almost fully protected. So closed to all commercial and extractive activities, which is really ahead of its time. It was catalytic in sort of uh, inspiring a lot of the other large scale marine protected areas that have come since. And the Republic of Kiribati has three island archipelagos, the Gilberts, the Phoenix, and the Line Islands group. And the Phoenix Islands protected area sits um, in the central archipelago and is a really important climate laboratory for a couple of reasons. One, it's largely uninhabited. So there's no people. So all of the or there's 25 to 50 people in the entire California-sized archipelago. And um, that means that a lot of the issues that other coral reefs face from pollution or overfishing or terrestrial runoff, um, these corals don't face because there is just a very, very low density human population. The second reason that it's such an important place is because um, it has just done an incredible job of protecting all of this with very few resources and yet has been able to um, put aside this very special place, which has a whole lot of different ecological features. So, um, and just again, for his, uh, scale and perspective, it also sits right next door to uh, the United States Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, um, Howland and Baker, um, which is just up here. And so I like to think of it as the protected area next door in the middle of the ocean. All right, so like I said before, it has lots and lots of different um, ecological um, features and different habitats and sites. And so if you take a look at a close up look at this box, there's the islands, which are marked in black, a number of underwater seamounts, a deep water area, a whole lot of open ocean um, and abyssal plain. And this protected area is only a very small percentage of it is tropical coral reefs, right? Tropical coral reefs are only going to live um, near the surface, right around the rings of um, these atolls and in the lagoons and on some of the very, very shallow submerged seamounts. But it's still a very important part of the ecosystem. And so the gazillion dollar question is if you're in, the place of, in a place in the middle of nowhere where there are few people, few other anthropogenic impacts, um, and just the only, um, the only really major thing happening are the effects of global change and climate change, um, what do the coral reefs look like? And so in order to answer that question, um, we're going to look at the shallow coral reefs, which, like I said, sort of ring the, um, these atolls and these islands and, um, you know, are at the shallow part of the overall seamount. I love this cartoon, you know, day 44 is still stranded with nothing but flat, empty water. As far as the eye can see, this little guy doesn't realize he's sitting on top of a mountain and the very top layer of that mountain is where the coral reefs really, um, is where the shallow coral reefs are. So thinking about PIPA as a climate laboratory is really important. And again, just to put that in the context of global change for you, um, this is uh, the latest uh, reading from the Keeling Curve. 
um, it's just taken out its scripts. And um, we're currently at 416.76 parts per million in terms of the latest CO2 reading. And this was pulled just a few days ago from June 7th, 2020. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, it's a terrifying picture, right? This is our climate um, records have shown that um, things have been getting warmer and hotter consistently and persistently over time. This is these are warming stripes from 1850 to 2018. And um, you can see that we are living in a time where we are breaking records all the time. And corals, among many other plants, animals, um, I know across the world and in different ecological habitats are, you know, they have to deal with that. So PIPA is no exception to that. And that's one of the other reasons it's such an important climate laboratory is that it sits in the central Pacific Ocean where El Nino events can be fairly severe and fairly persistent um, in certain periods of time. And so this is a picture um, of the Pacific during the most recent um, large scale temperature warming event, which happened in 2015 and 16. And you can see that it got very, very hot um, in the equatorial central Pacific right around where the Phoenix Islands um, so when the Phoenix Islands Protected Area was first um, conceived, it was uh, it was conceived as part of a project uh, actually with the New England Aquarium and the Republic of Kiribati um, to go out and look for primal reefs. This is not my picture. I was not there. But this is you're looking at a photo of um, Dr. Greg Stone, who was, um, went to the Phoenix Islands in the year 2000, where this is sort of the, the common picture, you know, beautiful carpet. Uh, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting of corals, you know, as my friend Rob would say, squillions of fish everywhere. And um, the island and the reefs looked, rel you know, intact. Rel you know, I'll use the word, I'll dare to use the word pristine. In fact, this was part of a project called the Primal Oceans Project, where Greg was out looking for reefs that um, were evocative of a primal ocean. And then the first bleaching event hit in 2002 and 2003, and these beautiful, stunning reefs a lot of them experienced severe mortality. And when I say severe mortality, I mean going from, you know, 70 to 80% coral cover down to 0% in some places with really nothing left. And you see, you know, it's just a photo, but um, all the correlated things that will come along with that are real, right? You, this, this change in water quality, right? It's, it's sort of more turbid and murky, this loss of, um, you know, high fish abundance, right? There's a lot of cascading effects that happen when you lose your foundational species, your corals. And this was very sad. And it, uh, it's really important to note that this is one spot in the Phoenix Islands. Each spot sort of experienced things differently. But um, we sort of have been watching this place over time and um, have been able to document its recovery, which happened relatively quickly, really within about a decade. Um, which is amazing. And it's, I think, partially because this site is dominated by these large table corals, these acroporids, which can grow really quickly and can sort of reestablish this layered, um, delicate landscape pretty quickly. But then in 2015 and 2016, this place, um, these islands, the Central Pacific, bleached again. Um, and we were terrified to, see, to think that they may not, they might have lost all of that recovery and gone back to zero. But instead, what we found is uh, that these corals were able to persist, um, which is really incredible. And this is a photo from 2018 showing the continued growth of these corals. And I'm gonna show you just a little bit of a video of a student of mine um, from BU who went out there last summer just to show you our most recent look at what this Canton Lagoon looked like. When we had some downtime, we would go out to these amazing coral reefs that are one of the most pristine coral reefs in the entire world, and nobody gets to see these. Every single time we went snorkeling, we would see manta rays and sharks and hundreds and hundreds of different types of tropical fish. Yeah, that was really amazing to see how everything interacts and how everything is supposed to be. Okay, so things still look good, despite the fact that everything bleached um, again in 2015 and 16. And just to sort of put this in context for you again, uh, the 2015-16 bleaching event is outlined in the red, um, the bright, dark red line along the top here. You can see my cursor. And that's compared against the average from all the other years in black and each individual year is different color. So it was a pretty major bleaching event. And yet, while other sites certainly were affected, this site um, has continued to recover. 
when reefs bleach, um, and the Phoenix Islands that we know of has bleached three times in relatively recent history in 2002 and three, 2010, and again in 2015 and 16, um, and when reefs bleached, oh, bleach, you know, they, um, like I said, there's two aspects to resilience. They can either, um, not, not every coral bleaches at the same rate or the same pace, which you can certainly see here. Um, and some corals can recover more quickly than others. And some corals can recover while others do not. And trying to unpack that, right? Trying to understand which reefs do well and which reefs don't is really complicated. And it's, um, you know, it's one of those topics that a lot of coral reef biologists are paying attention to right now, trying to understand um, which spots are devastated. And so this is the 2015-16 um, bleaching event. This is a sort of showing um, the sort of center of the major El Nino event. And you can see that the Phoenix Islands were right at the edge of it. So they actually experienced var variability of temperatures across the islands and a variability of bleaching. And so here is a snapshot of the degree heating weeks during that event. And you can see each of the islands um, sort of outlined in a black diamond. And if you take a look at where each one of these were um, and how, where they fit, you can see that temperature alone does not always show who's going to bleach the worst. So this is Arona Island. We're in the bottom red arrow. And you can see that Arona had um, some of the highest um, percentage of bleaching, but actually had experienced some of the lower temperatures during that particular event, um, thinking about degree heating weeks. And so it's not always... Um, temperature or degree heating weeks alone, um, which is something that we're just starting to really understand. I would say we're, we're really, um, that's something that the whole world is beginning to realize that there's a lot of local oceanographic factors, coral condition, host condition, and, and the relationship of the symbiosis that is going to matter and impact whether or not corals bleach. We also know that different species of corals and different genera can behave differently. So we're in the process of looking at the data from that bleaching event. This is Kara Johnson, who's been working on this paper. And she, for example, noticed that you'll find a whole lot of bleaching in Fundia, which is a sort of small mushroom coral, and not a whole lot in Acropora, which was very surprising to us given how much it bleached in the year 2002 and 2003 at that bleaching event. So unpacking these little individual stories to try to understand who's bleaching and who's not is um, one of the most important things we can learn from these remote places. So how do we do this? You know, we have a couple of different projects going on, and um, one of them is sort of local to the California area. So um, Stuart Sandin and his group um, out at Scripps are working on a project called the 100 Island Challenge, where they are going to 100 islands uh, twice, at least twice, and taking these large-scale photo mosaics, so taking tens of thousands of pictures of each individual reef sort of um, overlaying them and putting them together and looking to see what a composite image of a reef looks like. And once you've done that, you can look at it through 3D space or you can, what's called orthoprojecting or take a very, very constrained view, um, but it's very precise spatial um, view of a reef over time. You can layer different um, time images on top of each other to look to see how a reef changes. And here's an example of that where you can see, um, I hope you can see um, this is the same coral that you'll um, on the left that you'll see on the right, uh, but over one's over 2012 and one's in 2015, and you can see the change, right? The growth, the loss, um, and the change in coral cover over time. And my student Brenna Stallings is work, doing a great job um, working on this for the Phoenix Islands, which are eight percent of the Hundred Island Challenge. All eight islands are in it. So what Brenna and um, the everyone at Scripps is doing is taking a look at these reefs, these e reefs and tracing each individual colony to try to understand how they change. And this is really important for multiple reasons. One, it's to get this spatially contextualized view of not just which reef is surviving, but which coral species, in which environment, at which place. And if this sounds incredibly challenging and hard and complex to really nail down how each individual coral is changing over time, it is. And that's why, um, uh, you know, it's taking just, uh, it's just a massive amount of sort of new and innovative technology to really dial in how to do this and how to, you know, make, come up with these analysis pipelines to do it. But I think one of the key pieces of this is that every single reef is different, even on a single island in the Phoenix Islands. And these islands are small. Um, if you go to the windward side versus the leeward side, um, you can sometimes see completely different coral communities. Um, or even just a depth change of a meter or so sometimes can give you completely different coral communities. And so understanding that complexity um, is a real challenge, but is a really important piece to understanding resilience. 
And there's also species specific resilience and colony specific resilience based on sort of the symbiosis and the oceanographic, oceanographic factors um, that each coral is experiencing. And so I just want to let you into the complex lives of corals and how much um, and how hard of a question this, you know, this is to answer, even though it's pretty simple, you know, which coral reefs are surviving and why it's actually really complicated. So what Brenna and Stuart and the rest of the 100 Islands Challenge team is doing is taking these multiple composite images, stitching them together. Um, we can look at reefs in space or we can look at them top down, tracing them. And um, this is actually not from the Phoenix Islands, but this is elsewhere in Kiribati. You can take a look through time. And just to give you guys a sense of what this looks like, this is straight from the 100 Islands Challenge project. Um, you can really begin to understand um, how different reefs change. Um, and not just one individual coral, but what a reef scape looks like, right? How a whole piece of seafloor changes together. And it's that spatially explicit, spatially um, contextualized view that's really powerful about this approach. We do know that some coral reefs are surviving and doing really well and trying to understand why is amazing. We also know that some sites are not. And um, it's, it's confusing because you, some of the sites that are not everything should point to the fact that they should be able to recover, especially in the Phoenix Islands. There's no people, there's very little pollution, there's really not much fishing, there's really nothing going on. But yet some of these sites are unable to recover. And in trying to think about why, um, one of the things that's coming to light is that it's potentially the influence of um, iron pollution. So shipwrecks. So this is, you know, it's, it's now current anthropogenic impact, but this is a longer sort of historical scale anthropogenic impact that is still influencing reefs today, you know, tens, maybe, um, you know, dozens of years later, right? Uh, and trying to take a look at what, um, how that influence still influences it today. So basically the Pacific is relatively iron poor. And when you put a shipwreck, um, an iron based shipwreck um, in the sea, sometimes there's iron leaching and you can have iron enrichment, which can fuel microbial cascades, which can inhibit recovery. And so Pete Gaughan, who's another student, and also um, he works for a full-time employee at the New England Aquarium, has done a, a really interesting project where he has elevated um, the seawater temperature experimentally on ship and taken corals from these places that are not recovering and has put them um, and places from places that are recovering and has basically put them into the same experimental context. He's elevated um, seawater by one degree or kept it the same and he's either added iron or not. And every time you add iron and temperature, that combination, um, you watch coral mortality increase. So corals decline. So it looks like there's potentially some really important interacting um, factors that are contributing to reef resilience. All right, we still have a whole lot to discover about corals, how they work in the shallows. Um, there are many, many people in the world working on this important question. But for me, in my role in the Phoenix Islands, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how corals everywhere across that whole seamount are responding to global change. And in order to um, not be this guy, right, to like um, to sort of unveil what lies beneath, you know, I really have started to think about seamounts and try to think about corals all the way, uh, you know, along the gradient. And so there are some similarities with deep water corals and shallow water corals. So let me introduce you to deep water corals using this fantastic video produced by um, the NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. <music> A lot of these octocorals and even hexacorals have polyps, which are actually part of the organism. They're colonial. Uh, they're not individuals. They actually collaborate and they share resources like food particles that one part of the colony captures, say, up on the branches to down near the base through common tissue. It's all about working together. Working together to survive and to thrive. Okay, so just that's your first glimpse at deep sea corals, right? And they live in an environment where there is no light, so therefore there's no symbiotic relationship, right? Um, 
but yet they're still colonial. They're still sharing resources. They still have these extended polyps and they still, and they capture food, right? So they're eating in order to maintain their lifestyle. And the light that you saw was the light of an ROV, um, a remotely operated vehicle that we bring down with very strong lights, essentially, right? Um, strong lights to illuminate them for probably for the first time. They've probably never been seen. And this is not, um, you know, jump off the boat, scuba dive, jump in the water. This is this is a big endeavor. It takes um, some large ships um, and some incredible technology and a whole lot of partnership to get everything done um, and to be able to visualize and see these corals and study them. And so the Phoenix Islands had never been looked at in the deep sea until 2017, where we were very lucky um, with work done by the NOAA Ship Okeanos and the Office, NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. And um, the the FALCOR, which is run by the Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, both were able to go out and together did about 25 dives and helped map um, part of the protected area, which now means that the, the Phoenix Islands protected area is around 21.1% map. And you have to map these areas with, um, uh, with pretty uh, high resolution in order to be able to put down a large vehicle um, because the existing maps are inaccurate. So if you take a look at the top here, you can see this gray blob, which was the best map we had before. And then um, uh, once they've been sort of mapped with multi-beam, you can see that we have a much higher resolution. And if you were to superimpose these, I love this. Just check this out, right? There's a 950 meter difference between the actual top of the seamount and the estimated seamount depth surface, right? So that's a big difference between um, what we thought and what reality is. And before you put a large you know, SUV sized robot on the bottom, you need to know uh, if you're going to crash it, right? So a map is really important. And once you have this map, the way you do deep sea exploration is to pick a pick a trail, sort of pick a cruise track um, or an RV track and follow it. And so um, my friend, Jan Whitting, um, I thought just had the perfect way to explain it. He said, it's like you go up one tiny trail at night with nothing but a flashlight and see what you see. And then you go home, right? And this represents about eight hours of seafloor time, bottom time. Um, and this is all you get to see. So even this sites where we've seen, um, we know that there's a lot left to see, right? These are not fully explored. And this is what this looks like um, to have an ROV going down and exploring the deep sea. But when you go, right, when we start to put the whole picture of Pippa together, you know, we know what's going on in the shallow reefs. We know places which are doing well. We know places which are not recovering. We know what the coral cover looks like at this point. We know a lot about the basic oceanography. We've been studying these islands for about a decade. You know, we're beginning to get a feel for how they operate. And all of a sudden we take a look in the deep sea and we have to put all the pieces together. So this is a clip from the very first deep sea dive ever done in the Phoenix Islands protected area, just to show you um, what it's like. Carundalay Reef is within the Phoenix Islands protected area. This is the first dive ever to the sea floor uh, at this reef and your eyes are seeing this for the first time, much like we are. And we've really encountered a number of different types of corals throughout, as well as sponges and, and associated organisms that are living with these animals. There's, I think, Carissa Gorges in the background. Oh my goodness. Black corals just above this one, and it's a coral smorgasbord. This is a hot spot. You can say that again. This is a hot spot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow, this is an incredible dive, pilots. It's awesome. We're having too much fun back here. Okay, so that gives you a sense of what we found down there. And what's even more amazing is when you start to realize how large these corals are and how slow they grow, um, you can start to basically put a timestamp on their age. And a lot of these are long-lived deep-sea giants. Uh, these corals have been alive for a very long time, sometimes um, I mean, often, easily, uh, we'll find corals which are hundreds of years old, and sometimes ones that are thousands of years old. I showed you Big Mama before, a hundred-year-old coral, but some of these have lived for 2,000 or 3,000 years. And putting that in the context of human history, right, all that's happened in 2,000 or 3,000 years of human history is mind-blowing. So it's really incredible to think that these corals um, have lived through all of that, and um, if we don't mess them up. I mean, we hold them for that, that, you know, two to two, three thousand years um, longer in the future. So trying to again understand the resilience of shallow water corals is hard enough, but trying to understand resilience of deep water corals is yet another challenge. But they're huge. I'll show you, for example, what, last video here. Um, 
just a sense of um, how big they really are. And um, you'll hear the magical words, my favorite words in science, I don't know, which is um, how we realize how, uh, how much, it's how we make discoveries and how we realize how much there is to still know. Here we go. What do we have here? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. That is incredible. It this has colony a, is it, huge. Oh, wow. I think, I think I'm leaning towards giant Paragorgiates. Bigger than we've ever seen so far. This is a really that's, amazing colony. That's fantastic. A lot of delicate looking corals all around this humongous uh, glass sponge. It's got to be ancient. Yep. Ancient Paragorgia and ancient sponge. That's right. Something big off to the left. This is spectacular. <laughs> what a stunning way to end. Whoever said the land of giants wasn't kidding. That's right. So, you know, and that was me at the end. One of these ama amazing things about these dives is uh, there's people on the ship and then there's people at home, you know, uh, deep sea science was doing telepresence and zooming before it was cool and the whole world was doing it. Um, and it's one of these uh, ways where you can get way more expertise to participate in a dive because um, you can watch the dives in basically real time and communicate um, from shore. Which, and so that, that telepresence technology has been able um, to um, enable people, scientists from around the world to participate in this. And the reason why you need so much global participation is because everything you're looking at is new. So there are a whole lot of different coral species down there. This is a slide put together by my um, colleague and collaborator, Tim Schenk. Um, and we were working collaboratively with the Cordes Lab, Eric Cordes at Temple University. And uh, the three of us were working on this cruise on the Falcor. And um, and every everything that you look at is colorful and is beautiful. And um, some things were known and there were plenty of new species or new records or range expansions that we didn't know either. And, either whether we were working on the Falcor or um, when the Okeanos Explorer went out, it's really helpful to have a global community of scientists who are able to contribute to the real-time taxonomic identification or likely identification of many of these creatures. So it's pretty incredible. And what we found down there is that corals are living um, all along the slopes of those seamounts. And just like shallow water corals, they are a host to a diversity of life, many other organisms, right? Like this big red Brazingid sea star or some of these urchins, which are all using this coral, right? Um, which you can sort of see behind it um, as a substrate, right? It's a really important um, substrate to live on. And we found corals, um, which have some similarities, like I said, to the shallow water corals and some which look very different, right? This is Neritic Gorgia, it's one of my favorites. And this sort of spiraling pattern um, is characteristic of it. And to me, it just, it looks otherworldly. Uh, and the spiraling pattern is most likely, I would think, to enable the polyps to um, create a larger net with which to capture food as it falls from the surface. Um, and so there are some coral creatures down there which have been alive for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And we have no idea how they're going to fare um, or if they'll be affected at all by um, global change or, about, um, or with the conservation protections that we put in on the surface. But we do know that if you destroy a thousand year old coral. You can't grow another one tomorrow. And what we know most of all is what we don't know. And so I'll just wrap up with a little bit of information about how little we know about deep sea corals or deep sea creatures in general. This is a student of mine, Brian Kennedy, who's been working on a project trying to quantify the unknown. Um, and this is uh, unknown deep sea creatures across the Pacific at depth at the family, genus and species level, and even at the species level, right? 20%, um, sorry, only 20% of what we, of what we um, see, we know, and at the family level, you know, it's only about, you know, there's still a ton unknown, right? This is like, a, I don't know, 20 to 40 percent unknown, which is pretty amazing. Um, this is a project that uh, was part of NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. Uh, they had a pro project called Capstone that spent three years traversing the Pacific, 189 dives. Um, and including uh, several in the Phoenix Islands protected area down here. And everywhere we went, um, new things were found. So this is the quantified unknown in terms of just deep sea corals. So if you take a look at this diversity pie chart, what you're looking at in the center is family and then genus and then species is the outer ring. And if you start at 12 o'clock and work counterclockwise, the large black bar is the percent unknown. 
um, at the species level, the genus level, and the family level. And you see just how, how much we still need to learn about who these corals are, let alone what they do. Um, but if you look um, over time, uh, sorry, over time, over depth, you can see that uh, as you go um, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, you get corals, different coral taxa with different um, depth tolerances and ranges. And um, we have still quite a lot to learn about how a coral can um, live over a thousand meter depth spread, for example, which ones can and which ones cannot. And if you take a look at uh, where we have the most concentrated effort um, or saturation in terms of what we what we've discovered, there's still plenty of places where we have an awful lot to learn. And the zero to 1000 meter range actually has a lot left to be discovered. There are different kinds of features in PIPA, right? There's the atolls and the islands, but also a bunch of different kinds of seamounts. And each one of those has a different level of unknown diversity. And if you look just at the corals across all of the Pacific here, if you look by region, we're in the South Central Pacific region in PIPA, and you look kind of across each of the coral taxa or the coral genera, you can start to see that some of them appear to um, be more common on different sort of geological features, which is pretty interesting. And so we have a whole lot of different things to learn about corals, deep sea corals, and um, across the whole Pacific. But in PIPA in particular, um, Steve Askovich, who's a student in Eric Cordes's lab, has started to really um, tease apart the different species um, by depth patterns and start to try to understand um, what the deep sea corals in PIPA look like so that we can run some comparative work and try to understand um, how each island differs from each other and how things change. So the corals that we don't know are as compelling as the corals that we do. And of course, this entire project happens in partnership with the Republic of Kiribati. Um, we are in part of a project with National Geographic and the MIT Media Lab, um, Katie Krafel, Diva Amon, myself, and many others to think about how to transfer technology, empower people to look at the deep sea in their own backyard, whether it's in the Phoenix Islands or the Gilbert Islands or the Line Islands, all throughout Kiribati and Pacific, um, working together to train on technology and get access to these unknown corals um, for everybody's sake so that everybody can learn more about them, but especially so that um, the Phoenix Islands protected area and the Republic of Kiribati can manage and understand their own waters. So I'll stop there um, and just say a really big thank you again to the Aquarium of the Pacific um, for having me for the Phoenix Island, to the Phoenix Islands Protected Area for enabling this um, line of research and to all of you for listening. I think one of the things that I like the most about working in this particular part of the world is that almost everything we find is new and um, it's a really fun sort of mental puzzle to try to take each piece as it comes and try to knit together the story of this entire archipelago and how it works. So. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for that terrific, terrific overview of the world of corals. You've been an important partner in many of these advances in our understanding of corals of all kinds, Te tropical, temperate, shallow water, deep water. I want you to say a word about when PIPA, the Phoenix Island Protected Area, the largest, deepest UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it was largely a bottoms-up effort that took vision and courage by these people because it not only restricted what others can do within the Phoenix Islands, it restricted what they could do themselves. Say a word about how this bottom-up effort. You know, all of the credit and all of the vision really goes to the Republic of Kiribati, who, um, and to uh, their partners at the time, um, the New England Aquarium and Conservation International, who worked together to recognize um, under, you know, really actually it was Greg Stone who first found this place on a, you know, and took a look and said, this place is really special. And the Republic of Kiribati said, you know what it is, and um, decided to work together to, um, to protect it. And at the time, right, these large scale marine protected areas didn't exist. And so the idea is to uh, they called it um, Pippa's gift, uh, Kiribati's gift to humanity, which is such a beautiful phrase. I love it. Um, and it's this idea that the ocean is such an, a culturally important thing um, for Kiribati and for so many other Pacific Island nations and frankly for everybody in the world, whether sometimes you may not know it, but the ocean is really, really important for all of us. And um, and to recognize that there there are some there's something really special and important and necessary and urgent about protecting part of it. Um, was really visionary. And so 
this country set aside this large place um, and the conservation took place in a sort of phased approach, but um, now it's fully protected, no take. And um, it, it really was ground up, right? It's a story of just how a few people changed the whole world because they didn't cre just create the Phoenix Islands protected area, but that protected area helped to inspire and catalyze many, many other protected areas that came after. So they set a very good example. And we hear now people say we need to save 50% of the earth, more, more than more people say we need to save 30%. But it's just not saving 30%, it's, it's the right 30%. In the ocean, it has to be those areas that are either rich in biodiversity or rich in productivity. And technology is going to allow us to identify those areas that we really should provide special protection to. Do you agree? Well, I think it's the people behind the technology that'll help us do that. But yes, I agree. Um, it's a, it, you know, surveying the world seems again, like something we should be able to do, right? You just send a satellite around, get a picture of the whole thing, decide where to, where to protect and you're done. But of course, especially when you're talking about what's underwater, that's really complicated task. And um, I think protecting the, protecting a substantial portion of it is going to be one of the most important challenges that we've ever faced, right? One of the goals that we've been trying to achieve for um, many years now is 10% of the ocean protected, and we haven't gotten there yet. And to try to get to 30% or 50% is a laudable goal, but it's we ha I, the world has to get behind this, right? Protecting the oceans is not negotiable. It's really important to our survival. And um, and we need, I think, technology and people behind it um, in order to make it happen. Yes. All right. You, you mentioned that some corals are hundreds, even thousands of years old. Modern humans, Homo sapiens, we're 200,000 years old. But our impacts on, on the ocean have really only been, uh, at least globally, within the last few hundred years. And so many of these corals have never experienced what they're seeing now, the changing in temperature of the world ocean at all depths, changing levels of oxygen and so on. So when, when you look at this, what do you think about the future in terms of old age of corals in the ocean? Oof, I can try to give you the optimist answer. I can try to give you the pessimist answer. I'm trying to figure out how to draw the line. <laughs> I want the I, realistic answer. Someone once said a pessimist is an optimist with the facts. Now, you say you're <laughs> an optimist. You have lots of facts at your disposal. Look into your crystal ball. What's the, what do you think the future is? I think the future is change, for sure. I don't think it's business as usual. I think we're going to see changes in coral communities, which are very drastic. Um, we're going to see some species extinctions, and I think we're going to see some resilience that um, is to be expected. So some of these species, which already is, display remarkable resilience and can um, uh, persist even against all odds, I think we'll continue to see some persistence, but the communities themselves will change fundamentally. And with that, we'll see a cascade of other changes with um, not just the fishes, but you know, crustaceans and mollusks and many other organisms, right, which are reliant upon these coral reefs. And so I don't think coral reefs as we know them will look the same even 50 years from now um, because they already don't look the same as they did 50 years ago. And that's a really dramatic um, change compared to if you look at any other 50 year change throughout history, right, they would have looked pretty much the same 50 years to 50 years. And the changes we're seeing now are very dramatic. So I don't think that shallow coral reefs will disappear overnight, but I think they are changing almost overnight. And I think deep sea communities, I don't know. Um, we know that from the, from the Gulf of Mexico that something like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill can make a really big difference in deep water communities very quickly. Um, but I don't have a sense uh, yet of how dramatic or what the species specific differences are going to be in deep water coral response to what's happening at the surface. I, I expect it'll be non-zero, but I don't know um, the it, extent of the change. Yeah, I think our, our challenge is to somehow to slow the rate of change so that uh, marine life can adapt or, or evolve in time to, to stay with it. I want it's just like flattening the curve for coronavirus. We can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. All right. With PIPA and in any marine protected area, you're controlling near field effects because you're not allowing overfishing, you're controlling pollution within, within a protected area. These are all near field effects. But if you look at the far field effects, in PIPA, for example, 
The people in the Phoenix Islands have contributed very little to climate change, and there's very little they can do to slow climate change. So what's our responsibility to help the, the people in PIPA control these far field impacts? And I think in particular, it's climate change. What's our responsibility? Stop carbon emissions now. Vote with that agenda in mind. And all the little things add up. And that's sort of my big message. Um, and, you know, I think that sometimes people think, oh, you know, I got I didn't even realize this was a problem. Oh, no, my environmental agenda now has to shift from protecting forests to protecting the oceans. You know, no, we're all on the same team, right? What you do for the environment in any axis sort of helps the environment in every axis. So everything that we do um, from the small stuff to the big stuff matters. But I would argue that everything that really has to happen to make um, to, to really make change at the pace we need it to happen has to happen um, at the scale of governments and, uh, it ha and how you vote and when you vote and the fact that you vote matters a ton. And uh, making choices uh, to cut carbon emissions, I think, is the number one, uh, should be the number one priority on our agenda. I, it's a good message to end on. So everything we do, it all add, adds up, but there are some things individuals can't do uh, and that only governments can do, but we're responsible for who those people are and the decisions and policies they make. Randy, thank you very much for a stimulating lecture. We look forward to having you out here in person when, when uh, everything permits. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone, and I watch our website. The next lecture is going to be about insects you can eat. So depending upon how long this pandemic, pandemic lasts and uh, what the food supply is, you might want to watch that lecture. Good night, everyone. <laughs>